Grace and peace to you in the name of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. morning. I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church this morning, especially want to welcome any visitors that may be with us today. If you are a first time visitor or maybe you've visited with us before, um, we, we welcome you. And we do have a guest information packet if you haven't picked one of those up before. And we'd love for you to, to get one of those. This is a green packet out in the foyer. And so that you can know a little bit more about us. And if you would fill out the guest information card, we can know a little bit more about you. So uh, we welcome you today, uh, all of you, those joining us on the live stream, those joining us listening to the radio as well. Welcome. A couple of announcements today. First of all, just a reminder that we will have discipleship groups today following worship. And so we invite you to join us for that. Adults will meet in the fellowship hall. Children will meet on uh, the third floor and the uh, youth will meet on the third floor as well and then we I think we have preschool meeting here on the second floor so all are welcome there's there's uh, there's less there's classes for everybody so we we want you to join us for our discipleship time also today as you came in uh, hopefully you received a, a stone and a magic marker uh, you're going to need those during uh, our prayer time and I'll tell you what to do with them um, I <laughs> They're not for throwing at the preacher if the message is bad. Just no throwing stones, Jesus said. No throwing stones. So hold on to these. You're going to use these. Um, I think we, did, man, did we get you markers and stones? Good deal. All right. So uh, you'll need those for later on. I'll give you instructions in a few. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to be made before we do our Mother's Day recognition? Vicki. All right. So, yeah, so part of Mother's Day, Deacon Senior Team has placed some cupcakes out in the foyer. So uh, I guess everybody will go out that way today uh, to get a cupcake. So mothers, uh, definitely feel free to take one of those cupcakes. Any other announcements before we do our Mother's Day recognition? Well, Jesus says that in terms of family, uh, that mothers and fathers are not just those who have biological children, but he said, whoever uh, follows me is my mother, my brother, uh, my father, part of my family. And so as the church, we recognize all women of the church as mothers uh, who are part of this family of faith uh, that help in raising children, uh, all of our children. I think somebody was walking around this morning and said, I can't find my children. It's okay. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of mothers here that are, that are here to take care of them. So I would invite all mothers, uh, all, all women to please stand uh, as we recognize you. And children, if you'll come forth, we have a small gift for you. Some cup, cupcakes are in the back with flowers here, and we'd like to hand these out to you today. Yes. For all the mothers in the faith, happy Mother's Day. As we gather for worship, Christ promises that where two or three or more are gathered in his name, he is with them. So let us welcome and open ourselves to the presence of the risen Christ in our midst this day.
Good morning, children of God. We are so glad you're here today. Um, our first hymn is number 19, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Would you please stand as we sing this together? So this morning's scripture reading uh, is more of a prayer experience. It's uh, based on an ancient way of reading the scripture called Lectio Divina, which is a Latin phrase, just means divine reading. And so I'm going to read the scripture a, t a couple of times through. And on the first reading, I want you to just kind of take it in, listen. Uh, on the second reading, uh, I'm going to ask you to reflect on uh, something. And then on the third reading, I'm going to ask you to to use that stone of yours and that marker, okay? So let us, let us pray together and practice listening to the scriptures in a way of praying the scriptures and letting it speak to us. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, Though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But as you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In 
In the second reading, I invite you to pray with me as you listen to the scripture. And in this reading, I want you to reflect upon what it means or what you think it means to be a living stone built into a house of God. So listen along as I read the second time. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, on this third reading, after I finish, I want you to write on your stone, if you were to build a house of living stones, a royal priesthood, a community of Christ followers who were called to be witnesses of the chief cornerstone, what would that community be made of? What would it need to be built into a living house of stones. So here one more time. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. But, but we once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So write on your stone the things, at least one thing, that is needed for the community of God's people to be living stones built into a house of God.
This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite our children to come forward for the children's sermon. I'm going to ask that those that I can't see on that side, come sit over here. You can come together. It's okay. Or scoot down. That way we're all up here together. I don't want you to be a living stone out there on your own. All right. So, it's the children's sermon this morning. And I think that Margaret said something very fitting this morning. We are all children of God. So this isn't just for you all sitting here. Um, how are you this morning? Did anybody get sunburnt yesterday? <laughs> Overheated, yeah. Um, guess what? Us mountain folk are a little, a little scared of the heat, aren't we? We go out and we get a little exhausted, but... Drink plenty of water, okay, because you'll probably want to be out in the sun again today. So, we read through the scripture today several times, didn't we? Now, what we want to make sure is that you heard it. So, today's scripture, it was actually Peter that was talking. And he was talking to pretty new Christians back then. And he was talking to Christians that were in a place called Turkey. Does anybody know where that is? Close. It's a lot closer than it is to the United States. I think it's somewhere in between Europe and Asia. Perfect. It's actually called Asia Minor because it is right in between Asia and Europe. So very good, Delia. Um, and then he uses some of the some language in there that we call similes. Have you ever heard of similes? Yeah, similes use, use like or as. That's right. Make a comparison. That's exactly right. They help us understand what he's trying to tell us. The comparisons made a lot of sense to the people living 2,000 years ago. But sometimes today, we need a little help understanding them because the comparisons aren't as familiar to us. Right? Right? We all aren't out running around tending to flocks of sheep and things like that anymore. So the first comparison says that we should be like newborn babies and crave or desire spiritual milk. Now, do you have to tell a baby to want milk? No. 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 It has an instinct. It has a drive. It has a craving for mother's milk, right? It needs it every day. And what does that milk do? It gives the baby nutrients. It does. It does. Now, I've been told when I was your age by commercials and by ads in magazines that it does a body good. Okay? And they kept asking me this question if I had milk. And guess what? Today, I got milk. Um, but in order for it to actually nourish us, what he's telling us is it has to be pure. We can't water it down. We can't alter it any way. And it's best directly from the source. Guess what this is? Whole milk. Whole milk, not part milk, right? No, 2%. Not 2%. <laughs> not none of that watered down blue milk, right? It's whole milk. What's this? Strawberry milk. 2%. Who likes to drink strawberry milk? Yeah, but guess what? 
this has changed in some way. So what we're craving actually isn't the milk. It's something that's been added to it. Now, I got, I got to be honest with you. I got spoiled with milk when I was a kid because guess what? We had a real cow, and that cow actually got milked, and that same day we got to drink that milk. And I have to agree with Jesus. It's best when it's directly from the source. Um, so just like the milk with a baby, the Word of God is necessary for our growth as Christians. God wants us to desire, to crave, and yes, to actually want to consume it regularly, daily, and directly from the source. So who are the newborn babies in this story? It's almost like we talked before this. <laughs> Let me tell you what I wrote down, Drew, or Delia. The truth is, it is all of us. So we're, we agree, right? And each of us can experience the personal joy of hearing the Lord's words again and again every day as we read about it in the scripture. So the second simile... Did y'all catch what the second one was? Okay, well, we'll go over it. The second simile is that all of us, you and you and you and you and you, and yes, Pastor Michael and you and you, all of us, everyone here are like living stones. Living stones. Does that make sense? This is the one that needs a little bit of explanation, okay? Because we don't really build our houses out of stones anymore, do we? We went backwards on the three little pigs. We build them out of sticks again. Um, so you are, all of us are, living stones that are being built into a spiritual house. This kind of gives me a lot of joy and comfort. And guess who the first living stone also called the cornerstone, was? You're both right, because Jesus was God living on earth, right? Yeah, it was Jesus. So a stone by itself, it's just a rock, right? Doesn't serve a lot of purpose. It's not that special. But when you start stacking them together on a solid foundation, you can build something just like this building that we're in today. I believe that Peter is saying here that just like Jesus did when he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So Jesus isn't just among us. He is our foundation. He is our cornerstone. That's right. He's our rock that we start with, isn't he? And when we are stacked side by side with other followers, we can become a holy temple. We can become a church. So I brought this right here, and this may have been a little dangerous to bring Jenga. So this is a good example of us as living stones, right? So each of us can be one of these blocks, right? Does that block down there, is that a fun game? No. No, it's, there's just one block, right? But when we put them all together, it's a lot more fun, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you can remove one, and we still have a structure, right? But, can you remove the bottom ones? Can you remove the whole bottom? No. What happens? It knocks over. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, spiritual house. Bye-bye, spiritual house. <laughs> so, that is what happens if Jesus is not the foundation of our spiritual house. It will crumble. It will fall over. And that will happen every time. 
So now as we get back to this, even as a living stone cannot build something great, even a living stone cannot build something great for God as it sits all by itself. So what God does in us together as a church is really important, right? Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, it makes Jesus' dream work. And that's really the whole point of this story, is that teamwork makes Jesus' dream work. I couldn't have said it better myself. He is building something out of us together. He is actually asking us to grow together. So now, would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for spiritual mothers. Thank you for their love. They help us Grow together in you. you. Amen. Amen. Ham is number 507. Lord, I want to be a Christian.
pray with me. <clears throat> the scripture today speaks about spiritual sacrifices and living stones. I ask that these offerings be monetary sacrifices and financial stones that can be used within the spiritual house to further God's mission within the church. Amen.
Thank you, men's choir, on Mother's Day. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> well, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord our rock, our redeemer, our cornerstone. Amen. Amen. You know, there have been a lot of images, metaphors, similes, word pictures to describe what the church is and envision what or who the church should be. The Apostle Paul used several. We read about some of them, uh, I guess a couple of months ago. Servants, a field house, or his, I guess his most famous, a body. Jesus called his followers branches, sheep. It wasn't maybe the best uh, compliment that he ever paid to us, sheep. Uh, salt, light, foot washers. Today the letter of 1 Peter offers its own contribution to the many images that can help us understand who we are, who God is calling us to be, as a people of God, Peter calls us living stones. As we reflect on what it means to grow together as a church, let's ponder with Peter what it means for us to grow into a house like living stones. Now, it's not a surprise that the letter attributed to the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, would talk about the community of God like a house of living stones, right? I mean, we all know what Peter's name means, don't we? Peter, Petros, rock. Okay, we get it, Peter. After his resurrection, Jesus used his name with a play on words to give Peter instructions for the Christian movement. He said to Peter, on you, Peter, this rock, I will build my church. It's also no surprise that Peter used this imagery of a living stone for the people of God in this letter. He's writing to churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and, and they are dispersed all over this region. And, and in this particular time, many, if not all of them, are experiencing various levels of persecution by their neighbors. They're experiencing hardships. This, this life as new believers of Christ is not an easy one for these ancient Christians. So Peter is using imagery that would hopefully give them some hope, some stability. They were on shaky ground. They were on shifting sands with their faith, doubting, hurting, distressed. A rock, a stone felt like an image that would provide them with a feeling of strength and security as they faced the challenges of being a community of Christ followers in a culture that was not hospitable to them. So Peter encouraged them, telling them to come to come to God as living stones to Jesus, the chief cornerstone who was rejected by the world but chosen by God, precious in God's sight. And as living stones, he gave them a vision of the kind of people that God was calling them to be. So he said, like living stones, first, be built into a spiritual house by God. Like living stones, the people of God are to become a spiritual house, Peter says. The word translated as spiritual is logikos. It comes really from the word logos, which just means word, more literally reasonable or rightly ordered. The, the connotation is that the people of God will be guided by the word of God. It goes back to the imagery, the simile that, that Travis focused on in the first part of his children's sermon, the, the spiritual milk of the word. Essentially, Peter is telling them to be a community that lives by the way, the life, the teachings of Jesus. Be guided by the Spirit of God. Be guided by the way that Jesus lived and showed us this word made flesh. Now, the earliest Christians, especially these that were dispersed in Asia Minor, they didn't have, they didn't have their own copy of the Bible. They didn't have a canonized 
Bible like we do today. They were more than likely teaching each other by word of mouth, by the teachings that came from the apostles, from the first disciples that spread this word out and the word continued to spread, communities continued to form, and, and they shared orally, essentially, what these teachings were, what this way of life was. In fact, the earliest Christians, they were not called Christians. They were called followers of the way. And it's this way that they tried to live by and follow. But notice the language. The language is to be built. Being built into a spiritual house. This is about community, the kind of community that we saw a few weeks ago in the book of Acts 2 where they were devoting themselves to the apostles', apostles teachings, the way of Jesus. They were sharing their lives in common. They were worshiping together as a gathered community. Peter is saying, give yourselves to God and to the way of Jesus completely. And when you do that, God will build you into a spiritual house, a spiritual community, a community built upon Jesus, the cornerstone of any life that lives in and with communion with God. Later in this same chapter, Peter expands this imagery of the people of God as from a house to a chosen people, a holy nation. Again, the idea here is that we are not only to place our trust and faith in Jesus and make him the foundation of our lives, but we are also to come together to be a community for one another. We are to do this together. This is not imagery of individualism, of individual stones. This is an image of stones coming together to build something we are to share in all of life. The joys and the sorrows, the celebrations and the losses, the thriving, the suffering. Just like Travis showed us one block out there on its own. If you've ever been to the ocean or if you've ever even maybe canoed or kayaked or floated down the New River, one of the things that you will notice is that if there's a bunch of stones just kind of out there on their own, you don't really pay attention to them. But one of the things that you see often these days, and, and I don't know why people do it, maybe it's something that's related to something very ancient, I don't know, but, but you'll see stones stacked on top of one another. Has anybody ever seen this? Am I the only one? Yeah, yeah, you'll see these stones. And you notice them, don't you? You don't notice an individual stone by itself. But you'll notice these stones if they're stacked together. Peter is saying a similar thing. You are like living stones. Let God build you into a spiritual house. Because, because on our own, people may not pay as much attention. But together, collectively, they will notice. They will see the witness of what it means to be a house of God. A house of living stones. In one of his teachings, Jesus said this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Jenga. <laughs> right? Yeah. A house of living stones built, built by God into this house. Part of our vision statement as a church is to be a harbor of God's love. A harbor, a house, a place where people can come and experience God's love. A harbor is a place that is safe, a place where people go when the world is cold and rainy and gloomy and dark. A place where people can go to feel the warmth of God's love, to feel accepted and welcomed, and where Jesus and his message are taken seriously, where Jesus' way, where his word is evident in people's lives and how they talk, but not just how they talk. What did Jesus say? Those who hear words of mine and acts on them. A house of living stones can't be built by God by words alone, but by our actions. Building is, is an act. It's something that is done. It's an action. As one commentator put it, 
it's not just that these believers worship in the house of God. They are the house of God. Which brings us to Peter's next point. As like living stones, we are to be a priesthood of believers. Now the priesthood of Israel was a particular group of people called out to perform a certain service in the life of the community. And it developed out of God's own guidance for the community to give different people different roles in the community of God. The intent was never that only a few would just be the ministers of the church. But at some point, this is how it was perceived and how it was practiced. We see that in the early church, the idea of what is now called the priesthood of all believers was already being revived. Jesus himself had, had done this by calling disciples and telling them to go preach, telling them to go do what he did as a rabbi. The idea is that all of God's people are priests. We're all to be ministers, ministering to, serving one another, as well as the communities in which we live. Another related word is apostle. We hear the word disciple a lot. Disciple means follower, learner. We're all disciples. We're always disciples. We're always learners. But then Jesus at some point called his disciples to be apostles. And that word literally means to send out. He sent them out to act, to, to preach, to, to teach, to tell others, to show others this word, this way of Jesus. The idea here is that we are called to preach the gospel. We're all preachers, not just me here on Sunday mornings, but all of you. I was talking to a man one time whose, whose mother became a preacher, and she became a preacher later in life. And, and when I talked to him about it, he said, well, we all knew she was a preacher. <laughs> he said, she's been preaching to us our whole lives. We're not surprised that she's now answered this call really true of all of us we're all preachers in some form or fashion we're all called to serve our neighbors to share the gospel to minister to one another in times of need the church is not just its ministers or a select few leaders it is a priesthood of all believers as we have heard the phrase maybe before every member a minister that's the image that Peter is giving here in Luke's gospel there's this story he gives a different version of Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that last week of Jesus' life. He entered into Jerusalem on a donkey. People are praising him, singing his praises. They're laying their coats down in front of him and welcoming him into Jerusalem, crying shouts of, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Luke gives us a little inside look into what's going on on the margins, on the sideline. And there's some religious leaders, and they don't like this. They don't like that people are praising Jesus and essentially welcoming him in this way. And they even say to Jesus, tell him, they tell him to, to command his disciples to stop. Stop praising him. Stop this praise and welcome of him as Lord. Jesus replies by saying this, I tell you, if, if these were silent... The stones would cry out. His point is, if the people of God don't praise God, don't share the good news of God, then someone will, or something will, even the stones will shout out. Peter comes along and says, hey, we are living stones. We are priests, all of us, ministers, preachers, you know, the mission of our church is to grow in Christ's likeness, to become like Jesus and his likeness. Like our high priest, we are called to be like him. That means we're all called to wash feet as Jesus did, to serve as Jesus did, to share the gospel as Jesus did, and, and you are doing that. You are being priest when you volunteer at the food pantry. You're being priest when you pack compassionate commissary boxes. You're being priest when you work on a habitat house. WMU, you're being priest when you do one of your many and varied projects that you do in our community. Those projects that are not 
publicized or advertised, but are certainly serving and ministering to people in our community. You're being priest when you teach a class here at church. You're being priest when you are leading children in the school system. You're being priest as a coach when you're coaching children and young people. You're a priest when you're splitting some firewood as a woodchuck. Priest. Going out. Apostles sent out. Living stones out in the community. Stacked somewhere along the side where people will see it. Not so that we can draw attention to ourselves and what we're doing, but so that we can draw attention to the one, the cornerstone, Jesus, the one that we follow, the one that we worship. Finally, Peter says, like, like living stones, you are to offer spiritual sacrifices. Now, living in a Christian community always, to some extent, requires sacrifice. Requires putting aside ourselves. Jesus said, deny yourselves, take up your cross, follow me. And Peter is saying the same thing. These Christians to which he is writing, they are experiencing persecution. And not just alone, but they are experiencing it together within their Christian community. They're suffering. They're having to make some sacrifices. I've shared before that, that one of the ways that a lot of communities would essentially persecute Christians in their own community would be by boycotting their business or disaffiliating with them completely. People lost friendships, they lost family members, they, they lost income. They were making sacrifices to continue to follow Jesus as Lord. Jesus himself said, I came to serve, not to be served. We know the sacrifice that Jesus himself made by giving his life literally for all of us. If we are to thrive as a community of living stones, we must make sacrifices. I love the story. I've been reading through our church history lately. I don't know why. I just, I've just been reading through our church history because I've been thinking about this whole growing together theme. I love the story of Effie Lowe Gamble. Effie Lowe Gamble was a charter member of this church. She's related to some of the people that still go to this church. But in 1917, the minister of the church left. The, the church started in about 1915 as a community that gathered at the old train depot. And, and they had a hard time keeping a minister in the very beginning. Interestingly enough, they haven't had a hard time keeping ministers uh, over the last, what, 90 years. But, but those early years were tough. It was hard to find an, an ordained minister. And in 1917, Reverend Reeves left. There were several ministers that kind of filtered through those first few years. And, and Effie Lowe sacrificed in order to continue the ministry of this church. She became the first church clerk. She invited guest ministers to preach, lining up guest preachers every Sunday. She even at one point wrote the Baptist State Convention and had some folks come here and stay for a few weeks to, to, to kind of minister to the church in its time of need. Many of those folks stayed with her in her home. She had a big family, and she still invited those people into her home to live with them for a weekend or a week or two weeks. She made lots of sacrifices. She served as a superintendent of the Sunday school, president of the missionary society, teacher of a woman's class. Her husband would also leave home early to start a fire at the church, probably because she told him to. <laughs> she made a lot of sacrifices, and, 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 and I, don't want to, I don't want to idealize what she did. I would imagine this was not easy. I would imagine this was very difficult and challenging for her to have all these responsibilities in the church and to have a family at the same time and to help provide leadership in a time when there was no pastoral leadership. But there was. There was pastoral leadership. There was Effie Lowe Gamble and other people in the church that kept the church going. You know, the physical cornerstone of, of this building was laid in 1930. 1930. But the real cornerstone was laid much earlier, in 1915. 
at the train depot when a group of people gathered and said, we're going we're gonna to be the first church of West Jefferson, of this, this new town that's being formed. And they made Jesus their cornerstone. It wasn't until, again, 15 years later that they actually built a spiritual house where people could come to worship. But before that, they had already, they had already allowed God to build them into a spiritual house because they were living stones Allowing God to build them into a house. They were a royal priesthood, ministering to one another and ministering to their community. And they were making sacrifices in order to make that happen. So today, let's remember the words of Peter. Like living stones, be built into a spiritual house. A house not necessarily made with hands but a house that is made by God, by people who follow the way of Jesus. Be priests, all of you. All of you, be preachers. Share the gospel in the various ways Jesus has called us to share it. And, and, and in the process, make sacrifices like Jesus did for us. Make sacrifices for one another. Serving each other. Loving each other. As Jesus has done for us. As the scholar said, it's not just these believers worship in the house of God. They are the house of God. So today, I invite you to come forward. And I want you to take your stone that you wrote on earlier in the service. The things that make up a spiritual house that's built with living stones. Place it in the container around these smaller stones. And I also want you to take one of those small stones and I want you to keep it with you and take it with you. And remember that as we build this house of living stones that we also go out as living stones, as priests to serve and to sacrifice the community in the name of Jesus. And remember that Jesus is with you wherever you go. Let him be your firm foundation, your cornerstone. Together, let us, let us pray before we respond. Will you pray with me? Christ, our cornerstone, help us to live in your ways. To be, living, to be like living stones that you are building into a spiritual house. As we come today to symbolize that with these stones in our hands and take stones with us, may they be a reminder that we, we are the church. We are the stones that you call us to go out and to share your living gospel and word with the world. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, but I do invite you to come to place your stones here on the table as we build this house together.
as we grow together, God has God is building us into a spiritual house. As living stones, let us go forth into the community to be that witness, priesthood of believers, that beacon of Christ's hope in the community. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.